Hello boys and girls, friends old and new from near and far, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we have something uh, quite uh, spectacular on the bench. An E Bel Primero. It's an uh, Ebel watch, 1911 is the model name, uh, with an uh, El Primero movement from Zenith inside, masquerading as an Ebel movement. It's a beautiful watch, very dressy I would say, with a white dial and a gold bezel and uh, golden highlights. Oh, I mentioned uh, that uh, the El Primer movement is masquerading as an Ebel movement. And Ebel has this thing that they uh, don't have display backs unless they have uh, their own movement inside. And of course they don't even produce their own movements anymore. But uh, anyway, let's look at the time grapher. Straight lines. Probably means that uh, the watch is uh, okay mechanically, just needs a service and cleaning. But it's kind of a crime to have such a beautiful movement and then not being able to show it. But here we have it. The El Primero. Now when I say the El Primero, that's a little bit akin to saying uh, the Ford. It's an entire family of movements and this one we're looking at here is uh, more or less the base model of the family, the 400. But they also have uh, moon face versions, they have an open heart version of course, uh, they have the D5 version with uh, silicone escapement. So it's really a pretty big family of movements. And it's also been uh, evolving pretty much ever since it was first launched. Speaking of uh, when it was first launched, the name El Primero itself, uh, of course, means the first in uh, Spanish for some reason. And I suppose, but it's a little bit like uh, sometimes in comment fields you see someone saying first and then they're like third in the actual list. And it's a little bit the same with uh, the El Primero. So for those of you who have uh, watched uh, other videos on the channel, uh, for instance the Navi Timer video, you will know that uh, most vintage uh, chronographs uh, are hand wound. Actually, all vintage chronographs made before 1969 are hand wound. Because uh, that's uh, when El Primero was introduced in uh, January 1969, with uh, Zenith banging their chest and saying, We're the first! So by the late 1960s, uh, most watches sold were automatics. So it was quite uh, natural that uh, chronographs would also be automatics. So it turned into a little bit of an arms race. Obviously uh, Zenith uh, competed. Uh, you had uh, the chronomatic group, Hamilton, Buren, Hoyer, Breitling. And then you also had Psycho. So uh, what happened was that uh, Zenith uh, was the first to actually say that they had uh, the first automatic chronograph coming. And then uh, the chronomatic group were the first ones to actually show one. And then obviously Psycho was the first one to actually mass produce one. So in that sense Zenith was kind of the third. But I suppose uh, El Tercero doesn't sound quite the same as El Primero, so that probably explains it. What uh, Zenith did do, however, is to make a very compact movement and obviously a very high beat movement. It wasn't only the first introduced automatic uh, chronograph, but also the first one to beat at 36,000 beats per hour, which is still quite rare today. 
in the videos of uh, the Zenith uh, 40T. I talked quite a bit about uh, the history of the brand and also touched on uh, the history of uh, El Primero. But in uh, short, Zenith was, uh, for some reason that's not entirely clear, acquired by another company called Zenith, which was an electronics maker uh, in the US. And the signs of the time, this was in the early 1970s, was that uh, mechanical watches were basically doomed. Quartz was clearly the future. So the whole El Primero, uh, all the sketches, all uh, the molds, uh, everything made to uh, manufacture them, was uh, set to be uh, destroyed. Luckily, uh, a stubborn uh, worker named uh, Charles Vermont he decided to not listen to his boss, so he um, actually hid all the drawings, all the molds, models, what have you, uh, behind the fake wall. And uh, they stayed there for a decade or so until uh, the coast was clear. That's how El Primero was saved. And it's been manufactured basically all the time since, with various iterations. The one we're looking at here is kind of the base model. We see it's also not uh, finished to any specific uh, degree in that sense. It's uh, finished to an all right standard, but nothing special. You will see versions uh, of the El Primero that's beautifully finished. And of course, then it would be a crime not to have a display case back. Anyway, we're taking off all the chronograph parts. And we see that uh, when we take the pallet fork out, there's still power in the train. So uh, that tells us uh, there's probably quite some dirt here. And yes, there is. So we touched uh, a little bit uh, upon this whole aspect of high bit movements in the Lord Marvel video. And it is clear that there will be uh, more wear in some of the parts in a high bit movement. It's uh, worth noting, of course, that uh, Zenith is um, one of the few Swiss uh, companies that still make their own movements. And uh, that also means that they sell their movements, which is quite obvious what uh, we're looking at here. But they also sold them to quite a few other companies, including Rolex. So the Daytona used to be uh, driven by the El Primero. And Rolex uh, tuned it down to 28,800 instead of uh, 36,000. But uh, there still aren't really that many weaknesses uh, to the El Primero. But there is uh, higher pressure on some parts. The um, solution with uh, the automatic winding is a little bit uh, different and not very strongly supported uh, by this construction. And there's also a couple of springs that are a little bit, um, how should I say it, weak, although they are actually super strong. We'll get back to that. But all in all, uh, a well-constructed movement. A couple of strange things, like having to tap out the yoke, for instance, is a bit uh, odd and the whole uh, keyless works is uh, honestly a bit uh, over engineered too many small wheels um, that will suffer if they're not uh, lubricated uh, well enough or often enough anyway we're almost ready for the cleaning machine we're just gonna peg the jewel holes take out the shock setting and do a little bit pre-cleaning because uh, there's still some dirt lurking. It's been a really long while since this movement has been serviced. And I think uh, this kind of proves that. That is some serious dirt right there. And when we see dry old dirt like this, that means it's been a really long time since uh, the oil was applied or the grease. 
or the sardine oil or whatever it is uh, people use nowadays. So that means it's uh, extra important that we uh, peg the jewel holes. We're not trying to get uh, the peg wood through the hole. We just want to uh, scrape off basically any old crud that's uh, solidified more or less in the oil sink. Let's see what's here then. Oh, that doesn't look dirty at all. That's kind of unexpected. But the main spring looks fine, so we're going to reuse it. And now let's fill up the basket and get ready for the cleaning machine. So while the movement is uh, being taken care of by uh, Mr. Elma, we're gonna take uh, a closer look at the case. We have these uh, five golden screws and we don't want to mar them that uh, hold down the bezel. We don't necessarily want to take uh, this uh, insert out this watch has a sapphire crystal and there's no scratches on it, so that's uh, fine. We're also not going to polish the case, but we uh, are going to clean it. So we're going to take uh, the pushers out, together with uh, the springs and the gaskets. And we're going to put all the metal in the ultrasonic. Here it comes folks, watch out for the sound. All right, let's start the rebuild. As usual, we start with uh, the barrel. We put a little bit of grease at the bottom of the barrel and then we can use some uh, Kluber uh, breaking grease on the barrel walls. Now for the mainspring, it's also an idea for this one to use uh, one size smaller arbor in the winder. So just as we did with that uh, stunning Tudor. When uh, we do this, however, we have to be a little bit uh, careful. It's very easy to jumble the mainspring. back together we can uh, look at uh, the capstones I put a little drop of 9 to 10 in the middle of them and then we can put them back into uh, the shock setting now it's almost Christmas and uh, I've been a really good boy all year, even though uh, you guessed it, my wife might not think so, but then again maybe she likes bad boys, who yeah. And that balance seems to oscillate freely, beautiful sight. Before we uh, put together the rest of the movement, we're going to use an epilam or a drop on the escape wheel and a pad fork. And as I mentioned last time, we're going to dip a pad of stones into uh, the drop instead of dipping the whole thing. We still need to clean the pivots, so we do that uh, in this uh, pithwood. 
and then we can start the reassembly. Now look out, because there is one part here that's uh, up for some repair. See if you can see which one. If you notice uh, how the light reflects on this uh, ratchet wheel, it is bulging. So I think someone tried to put it on and press the bridge on without uh, having aligned the square hole with the barrel arbor. So to fix something like this, we can use a steel ball inside this barrel closing tool. That makes it uh, self-centered. Then we can tap it uh, with a small hammer. Obviously, uh, don't go crazy here, huh? That seems to have done it. The risk if this wheel is uh, not uh, entirely uh, flat is, as you see as well, it's been scraping a little bit on uh, the barrel itself. But you might also have problems uh, aligning the click. Now we talked uh, a little bit about the uh, Zenith, but this watch is not a Zenith watch, it is an Ebel watch. And uh, Ebel is uh, a brand that um, maybe not a lot of people are that familiar with. It is an old brand, uh, it's currently part of the Movado group. Oh no, not the Movado group I hear you say, but yeah, unfortunately. The same Movado group that sold Piaget for 30 million and bought uh, MVMT or Movement for 100. Yep. So it's not really in, um, let's say, the real watch enthusiast sphere. You will mostly see Ebel in uh, jewelry stores uh, alongside uh, Fossil and uh, fashion watches. But that is uh, short-selling the brand a little bit. It is a solid brand. It has a long history. Used to even make their own chronograph movements. And Movado was kind of uh, setting them up for being uh, the in-house movement uh, company in the group. But that didn't really work out. But in terms of market positioning, uh, it's probably at the same level as uh, Hamilton, Rado, those kinds of brands. So uh, Abel is absolutely a quality brand. They're just not on most watch collectors lists, I would say. But neither is MVNT, yeah. Maybe you'll find them in the watch collectors uh, garbage bin. Interesting little point here. The winding stem is actually hollow. And you might have seen uh, that the sliding pinion fit onto this little uh, rod that uh, the stem also then fits onto. A bit more complicated than uh, necessary, I would say. And I don't really see uh, the big benefit of it. Anyway, we are over on the dial side. We're going to put uh, together the keyless works. And with that in place, we can uh, then uh, time the base movement. I'm going to press fit this uh, plug again for the yoke. The setting lever also has a little extra arm on it uh, that uh, interfaces with this uh, date uh, changer here. It's important to get those two uh, in the right uh, position relative to each other. And uh, that uh, date changer mechanism there, really overdone, I think. It's not necessary to make it that uh, complicated and uh, fragile. But it's uh, very interesting to see uh, this movement. 
the base of this movement uh, was designed in uh, the late 60s so when quartz was sort of underway but no one really took it all that seriously yet so they still over engineered stuff and did things that they really didn't have to do and then compare that to uh, what Le Mania did a few years later when the quartz crisis was uh, fully storming what we uh, looked at in the Chronosport Chronosale, the Le Mania 5270 movement where they used a lot of plastic and uh, employed uh, let's say low cost techniques but still managed to build a very high grade uh, movement and sort of seeing uh, these movements in uh, the light of the situation they were uh, conceived in it's uh, very interesting for those of us who are watch nerds but then again i guess if you're watching this video you're probably guilty as well so with the killer sparks in place we can uh, put in the pallet fork and we're going to give it a little wind and then we're going to lubricate uh, the pallet stones in a high bit movement like this we have to use uh, grease so uh, we're using a 9415 from uh, Mebius and the reason of course being that the grease stays a little bit better on uh, on the surface and with a high uh, rotation speed of uh, these uh, movements uh, that helps keep it in place All right, watch is ticking along. Let's uh, oil the pivots and then we can put them on the time grapher and see uh, where we are. Remember the watch um, was actually running pretty okay considering. What we want to see on the time grapher is uh, first of all straight lines. And then of course we want to see that it has uh, good amplitude, low beat error. And obviously that it keeps time. We're first demagnetizing the watch in two uh, goes, 90 degrees uh, perpendicular to each other. And yeah, that looks quite all right. The amplitude would be a little bit higher when we put uh, the automatic works on, but this is uh, perfectly fine. So then we can commence with the chronograph. So we uh, have looked at quite a few chronographs uh, on the channel so far and more to come. Of course we're going to do the Psycho 6139 just over uh, Christmas or in the new year. But uh, the El Primero does uh, sort of keep the roots it is a column wheel uh, chronograph, horizontal clutch, let's say the classic uh, layout. So quite different in that sense from uh, the 7750 of course and uh, that family. Now one of the typical questions you get as a watchmaker or as a let's say advanced enthusiast is uh, how do you remember where everything goes? And the thing is, there's a very sort of clear logic to it. And uh, the main thing uh, perhaps to remember is uh, where the screws go. And uh, what I've done uh, on this movement as well, as uh, you have seen in some other chronograph uh, videos, is that I put the screws back in the screw hole after taking them off in the chronograph uh, parts that uh, really does help you keep uh, the screws uh, where they should be another thing if uh, you're working on movements there's a pretty solid chance that you're uh, peeing standing up and no i don't mean while you're working on them that would be uh, inconvenient and unhygienic of course personally I do think it's nice to be sitting down as well then you can you know check your phone and read a book and do all kinds of stuff 
what I'm actually trying to get to is that, of course, most watchmakers uh, are men. I think that is actually changing a little bit. You see more and more girls and women uh, in the trade, and that's really good. Actually, when you look at uh, the watchmaking factories around the world, uh, most of the workers are women. But most uh, watchmakers are men. And if you're wondering where I'm going with this tangent, I honestly forgot. So let me just rewind and check. So uh, Stian from two minutes ago, what was I actually trying to say with this? Hey, don't look at me, man. I don't know what you're trying to say. Oh, I actually remember. What I was about to say is that uh, chances are that working on these types of movements, you're a man. And I'm, uh, of course, you know, that is the stereotype as well, that a man's man is most likely a watchmaker. But um, as a man, your first inclination, whenever you see something that can be uh, categorized as a technical manual, is to throw it away. No one's going to teach me how to put together a mechanical piece of 200 parts with screws uh, that look almost the same but aren't. Ha! But uh, yes, we actually do use and should of course always use uh, manuals when we have them. Technical communication as they're often called. And one of the best resources online is uh, watchguide.co.uk. So check that out. We're uh, checking to see if uh, the chronograph works as it should. So we just started it. And then we can uh, twiddle our thumbs for uh, one minute. Speed up the video a little bit. And then we can see if the minute changes over. Yeah, that looks good. Then we can oil the rest of uh, the pivot holes apart from uh, the minute uh, counter. We uh, never oil the minute counter in the chronograph. And the reason is that it creates a little bit of drag and there's very little force on it, so that is why. Given uh, that the El Primero also has an hour counter, that is, uh, as is common for our counters, directly tied to uh, the barrel. So we're going to put those pieces together on the dial side. Now I indicated before that uh, one of the other weaknesses of the movement is uh, one of the springs. And it's uh, a very strong, very pingy spring that uh, makes the date uh, flip over instantly. From what I know, they actually changed uh, that type of spring a little bit in uh, later versions. But uh, this one still has this old spring. I'm going to see that in a second. Right here. Now this spring can uh, break or uh, set. It is very thick. And actually this spring here is a little bit uh, set. So uh, I will change it before this watch will be put up for sale. What happens when the spring is uh, not strong enough is that uh, the date doesn't flip over instantly. And it reacts more like a typical uh, date. Let's also check that uh, the chronograph uh, hour counter works as it should. And that looks all right. Last thing to do then before uh, we can put on the dial in the hands is to put on uh, the automatic uh, date change mechanism. Quite straightforward, apart then from uh, having this uh, instant flip over.
the date disk itself is a little bit uh, different. It's actually held down by four screws instead of your uh, typical uh, cover plate. We're also going to oil uh, the date jumper a little bit. Put on some uh, D5 or HP1300 there. For the cannon pinion and the hour wheel we use uh, grease. And that looks all right. Then we can place the dial. We're starting and uh, stopping the chronograph so that we're sure that uh, the hands can be set to zero. And then we can place both the hour counter and the minute counter at the same time. So with the hands in place, we can uh, then check uh, that they actually reset to zero. So let's start it and then uh, wait a little bit. And we see the minute hand flips over nicely. The hour hand is a creeping hand as uh, most uh, hour counters are. But they both uh, reset correctly, so then we can put on the, the running seconds hand and then the central hands. Now, if you're, uh, let's say, lucky enough to work on uh, El Primero's often, it's of course a good idea to have a dedicated uh, movement holder. I don't. I work on quite a few 7.750s, but uh, not that much uh, the El Primero. Yeah, poor me. That, of course, uh, reflects the market position as well. The 7750 series is uh, really a workhorse used in almost all chronographs. While the Primero is a uh, very high grade movement, costs uh, a lot more. And obviously more complicated to service as well. All right, with uh, all the hands in place, let's uh, start the chronograph and uh, see if it resets. Yeah, it does reset. And uh, in slow motion, you can really see that uh, the second hand uh, vibrates quite a lot after uh, being uh, reset. Of course, what happens is uh, that the so-called hammer hits uh, those hard shaped cams on uh, the different wheels, on the chronograph wheels. And the shape of those uh, cams uh, forces uh, the wheel to rotate uh, around to a reset position. And of course, when you put uh, the hands at uh, zero at that point, then you reset to zero. Let's uh, get the case ready so we can uh, case the movement. We've got some new uh, tube gaskets. And we're putting on some silicone to make sure um, everything moves smoothly. That looks right. Then let's put on uh, the bezel as well. Personally, I think it's a beautiful uh, dress watch chronograph, if you will, with that uh, solid gold bezel, the golden screws, golden details, looks very nice. Perhaps a bit more uh, fashion-like than uh, sports-like, but uh, that is a little bit uh, the Abel style. Their logo has been described as uh, the kissing ease. And the last thing we're going to do before uh, the watch is ready to wear is to uh, complete uh, the automatic uh, works. Of course, uh, the rotor has a ball bearing in it. So we're going to lubricate that with uh, special uh, lubrication for ball bearings, the Lubetta V106. 
but you can also use 90-10. Shake it, shake it, baby. Just spinning the rotor a little bit so uh, that uh, the lubrication spreads. And then we can put on the case back. And you can see that the strap is actually screwed on. So uh, we have a special uh, Ebel Crocodile strap for this watch. And there we have it. Doesn't look uh, half bad at all. Beautiful watch. Very clean design. Classic, of course, with the Roman numerals and everything. The Ebb El Primero. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked the video. If you did, then clicking like and subscribe will really help the channel. We'll be back shortly with another video. Until then, ta-ta!